Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Renaissance Woodworker Live. Talking about scrapers today. So, um, as people kind of file into the chat room, um, you guys want to give me a sound check. It looks good on my end, but I always like to double check before I get too involved in things and people start saying, we can't hear you. Uh, while I get my various and sundry sca scraping stuff out. Let's just pull out the whole drawer. Okay, I got, I got a lot of sharpening stuff, folks. I've just have accrued over the years and as my sharpening system has kind of become optimized, if you will, I need to do like a sharpening media sale. <laughs> I've got so many stones and various things floating around. All right. Um, good. It all sounds good. So um, let's, let's get started. Today, I'm dedicating it to scrapers. I've had multiple questions uh, over the last couple of weeks since I uh, started these up during the whole quarantine thing. Um, and I just figured it would make a good topic in and of itself. So um, we're going to talk uh, not only about the, the ubiquitous card scraper, but the uh, number 80 cabinet scraper. And really, I can lump scraping planes to some respect into that as well. Um, I do not have a scraping plane. Um, but a lot of the, the similar issues with a uh, cabinet scraper, uh, basically a scraper that's going to be set in a body and held at a specific angle, um, they can all be addressed, the cabinet scraper and the scraping plane. The big difference being the scraping plane has an adjustable angle to that frog, which is particularly key. Um, although I will say, um, I don't know that, that adjustable angle is that big of a deal. Um, so the first thing I would say is, when it comes to the cabinet scrapers and scraping planes, I do not roll a burr on them. And the reason you really want that adjustable angle in the scraping plane is if you do put a burr, you need to set the angle of the frog so that the burr is engaging. I personally don't think the burr is actually necessary. So let's, let's kind of start there. Um, scrapers in their purest form is just a bit of steel that has a nice 90 degree edge on it. There's no burr, and what's doing the cutting is actually that aris, that 90 degree aris. If it's perfect 90 degrees, I mean, you've seen it, if you run your finger along a 90 degree edge, you're gonna cut it. Heck, you run your finger along a 90 degree edge of, of a piece of maple or ash or any particular hardwood and you will cut your finger. It's the same thing that is happening. You'll find all kinds of scraping tools like paint scrapers and things like that. This is actually a carbide scraping tool that Benchcraft had put out years ago. And it's just got a square ground carbide bit at the end. And it's really great for getting into corners and scraping out glue. Um, there's no burr on it. I wouldn't want to try to roll a burr on a carbide end anyway. But it's just, it's the purest form of the scraper. Um, scratch stocks are scrapers. So if you have like a fancy beading tool like this Lee Nielsen um, or just a regular old block with a bit of steel stuck in it, this is a beading tool. So if you look, you can see there's just a little bead profile. It's about an eighth inch bead profile. It's got a thumb screw in the end, it's held in place and all I do is scrape it along the edge of the board in order to create a bead. This scratch stock that bead profile is just ground 90 degrees to the face. There's no burr rolled. So <clears throat> that's the first thing. If you're really having trouble getting your scrapers to work, don't roll a burr and just see what happens. The burr can add some advantage, but at the same time, it's not absolutely necessary. And I think that's where people end up screwing things up when they start uh, sharpening scrapers is they, they, they screw up the burr. And the reason for that is a lot of times if the burr is rolled too steeply, what you're required to do is bend the card scraper over too far. Your knuckles are dragging on the work or you can't actually get it to engage that angle and you're getting dust rather than shavings because you're not matching the angle of the burr. 
Moreover, if as you roll that burr, you don't get a consistent angle and say the burr changes angle as it moves down the length of the scraper, you're gonna have trouble getting to engage. And a lot of times, sometimes it gets rolled so much that it's just weak and it pops right off. And what's left behind is not that nice 90 degree angle, but kind of a rounded over edge or a frayed edge that maybe is sharp, but it's also very delicate because instead of one unified edge, you've got it frayed and, and, and torn and each one of those tiny little frayed bits doesn't have much strength and it just falls apart after one pass with a scraper, you end up with a dull scraper. So <clears throat> there's your first troubleshooting symptom. You sharpen your scraper, you go to work and you get nice fluffy shavings and the second pass you get dust. What happened is you got fluffy shavings as you ripped the burr off the scraper and that's an indication that you probably rolled that burr too steeply so that it's really bent it down or you maybe rolled it not so much too steeply but you rolled it too much and you actually weakened the steel and it's turned the whole thing off. So um, my scrapers all pretty much need sharpening. So uh, I think we're in, in luck when it comes to demonstration of the difference between a dull scraper and a sharp scraper. Let's uh, use this bit of cherry. Um, the shape of the scraper, other than like scratch stocks where you're actually shaping um, bead profiles, molding profiles, um, I've got a bunch. I've just made them over the years as I've needed a certain profile. Um, recently, I, well, here, here's a good example of the rule joint, like a table edge joint for drop leaves. Um, I make that joint using hollows and rounds, but I created a scratch stock. And here is the, uh, the female, the cove, and here's the male part, the bead part, um, made on this little bit of steel. This is actually card scraper stock. Um, no, it's not. Now I can't remember where it came from. It's much, much thinner material. So it was relatively easy to cut the shape out with tin snips and then I just filed it to shape. Um, <clears throat> and what, what I use this for, even though I create the profile with hollows and rounds, is this come back, comes back and refines it all and gives me one consistent shape. But here's an instance where rarely with a profile like this, I would not create the profile using the scratch stock. While I could, it would take a really long time and a lot of subsequent sharpenings because this is gonna heat up and dull relatively quickly. This is the type of thing that comes back and takes this last two or three passes just to kind of blend everything together, blend any facets that may have been created by a block plane or a rabbit plane or something like that. This can be great if you are sticking your, your moldings by hand and you just need that last little bit, almost like coming it over with sandpaper, but a little bit crisper lines to things. Um, scratch stocks can be quite ornate Here's a reverse OG quirk and bead profile. Uh, I was making a um, Chippendale frame mirror and I stuck that whole molding and I created this profile to match the molding just to come back and scrape it and unify it. But more importantly, also to get some glue and things out at the miter joints. This was the perfect profile to come in and do that. And again, just a little bit of, I think I actually bought some scrap steel from uh, McMaster car years ago. I've got yeah, here's little pieces of it just floating around. Here's another original, I think the original piece was probably about this long. Um, and all these little pieces just float around. They get cut off using tin snips and they stay around for any number of, of reasons and purposes. Um, needed uh, a larger bullnose pattern at one point. So I created that guy for it. So you just kind of, keep these floating around in a drawer and keeping that material. If you ever um, run across a really old beater saw that you just can't restore, maybe it's been filed down so much that it's really, really narrow, or you get that saw that's really thin down to the end. Sometimes you can lop the end off the saw back to a thicker part of the saw, resharpen the saw with just a shorter profile. And that last little bit that you cut off, it makes great card scraper on a scratch stock material. So um, that that's the basic form is just this, shaped with a file, shaped with rat tail files and things like that in order to create the profile you want. The key is getting that shaped 
right at 90 degrees across the face in order to get that perfect 90 degree arras. The rest of the time, and the stuff that really um, kind of flummoxes people, is when we start dealing with burr and using a card scraper as like a finishing tool if you've got particularly uh, troublesome figured material or something like that. Um, a card scraper can be really, really effective to help clean that up. And let's see, this one feels pretty dull. Um, this is just a typical square or rectangular card scraper. I've got a couple that have been ground to different shapes. This has a curve and a little bit more radical curve on one end. Um, I've got, actually this one I didn't grind. This is from um, uh, Bearcat Toolworks. This thing, I love this thing. This is the perfect shape for hollows and all kinds of, well, I think, um, I think Brian actually uses this for scraping chair seats. Here's the, um, the gooseneck scraper. I use this one a lot for cove moldings and things. This uh, various radius can get into all kinds of things, even just by skewing it, you can get into even tighter radiuses and it does a really, really good job here. So, um, uh, blah, 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 blah. let's see. Uh, another hollow, um, another round. Um, <clears throat> I know that uh, Chris Schwartz over at Crucible Tools talked about how the rectangular scraper is more of kind of a, a modern, we didn't know any better. It, this was generally how it was sold and the craftsmen shaped it to whatever they wanted. And that's what I'm talking about with scratch stocks is that this bit of steel was sold and you did whatever you want. We've tended to leave them rectangular thinking that's what they're supposed to be. I do still have quite a few rectangular because I actually like the corner. The corner can be really effective for getting right up into things. If you have glued a molding in place and you got a little bit of squeeze out along the edge of the molding, it's fantastic for, for getting into those corners. Um, I've had several instances when I've been dealing with glue squeeze out on uh, dovetails and drawers. Just being able to use that corner and go in and kind of pick out some of the more um, ornery uh, squeeze out, that, that is a problem. Um, whoops Woodworking says, inexperienced with a 90 degree blade for the jack plane. Um, <clears throat> not the Lee Nielsen one. Um, I don't agree, let's just put it that way. Uh, essentially the 90 degree blade could be done the same way as a scraper, but because the jack plane is presenting it at that 45 degree angle, I just don't find that it's necessary. Um, I at first thought when they were selling that blade that they were selling a blade blank and you were meant to shape it yourself. And then somebody told me, oh no, they're using that as a scraper. And I, I was shocked at that because traditionally a scraper works best at a higher angle. So. I, yeah, I think you can get that now. That blade is part of like a set, several different blades all at once. I'll also go out on a limb and say, I'm not a fan of the toothing blade that both Veritas and Lee Nielsen sell. Um, it's not the same toothing blade you're going to find in a vintage toothing plane. Where's my toothing planes? Oh, it's down there under a pile of stuff. Um, it's, it's a different blade and it doesn't quite cut the same. Moreover, I don't agree with using a toothing plane for heavily figured material. Uh, I find that that's not absolutely necessary. Maybe I haven't worked with figured enough material that I found it necessary. But anyway, um, the other thing is, and actually, did that question just pop up? Um, yeah, good timing, Arjun. He says, do you prefer thicker or thinner scraper stock for normal uh, or finishing woods? Um, I've got a variety of thicknesses here. This is a much thinner scraper, a much easier to bend scraper. Um, this one, this one is particularly stiff. I actually got this from um, Ron Bontz over at Bontz Sawworks. Um, this is particularly thick. Um, I honestly haven't found much difference between the, the quality of the finish they leave. Um, the thing that I do like about the thinner ones is they are just more flexible and I can warp it and shape it to get into spots that I want to get to a lot easier. Uh, the other thing is I have these, um, actually I think Crucible now sells a vinyl magnet. I've got these uh, years ago when I went to Woodworking in America, I had these promotional hand tool school magnets made up and I use these guys as a heat sink to keep from burning my fingers because I do still burn or uh, bend my card scrapers. I find that that's the flexibility you get out of it. 
um, to get to certain spots. You can bend it different ways, bend it deeper, shallower in order to get the, uh, the cut that you're looking for. So um, I already had my camera set up on the sharpening bench, but I think I'll do a quick adjustment here and move it over here. For those that have already done it, thank you. But if you do have questions, it really helps me if you put them in all caps in the chat room. Um, so thank you to those that have already done that. I don't think I've missed any more. So this scraper uh, would help to actually change camera angle, wouldn't it? This scraper, I can feel a burr on there, but Honestly, it feels pretty ratty. It feels super aggressive. Um, and it's not particularly sticky. You know, that feeling between sharp and sticky sharp, it just feels more like it's kind of a rounded over section. So as I present the scraper, here's just the basic usage 101. I will present it 90 degrees to the work and just start to slowly push it forward while tilting the scraper and you'll feel when it starts to drag. That's the angle you want to present it at. And I will bend it and go start scraping. Now this is, you can see there's little shavings coming out there, but I mean, there's shavings, but there's a lot more dust in there. And certainly there's a little bit of shaving coming out. Um, but I also think they are not quite producing the surface that I want. This scraper is just starting to turn, if you will. It's slightly overripe. Surface feels okay, but I mean, you can see the amount of dust that's being created there. If I think if I flip it over and go the other way, I'm gonna get even more dust. Yeah, like nothing but dust coming off that other edge. And here's the other thing, don't forget these short edges. You can sharpen all the edges of a scraper because sometimes this edge can be really beneficial. So this one definitely needs to be trued up. I think this one may be about the same. Okay, this is a good example. Here, it's about the same level of, of sharpness, but the burr has been rolled too much. So let me come back to this first guy. So I'm dragging it forward and there it's engaging right at about this angle. I can very easily use it and not drag my fingers on the work. This guy doesn't want to engage until I'm down much lower and there's really no room for my fingers here. It's been rolled too far. So I'm actually getting some shavings here but it's so hard to use. I actually have to, the only way I can use it is because I've got a narrow board and my fingers are kind of straddling the board and I don't have very much control. This is an example where the burr has been rolled too far. And even if, I mean, it's a little bit dull at this point, but even if it were sharp, this wouldn't be a functional scraper. I really want to try to have the burr so that it's engaging just off of 90, maybe at 80 degrees or something like that. It's not a very acute angle that you're looking for. Um, I was just using this guy a lot, so I'm not sure. All right, that's easier. That's a scraper that is still sharp. First and foremost, I mean, look at the shavings that it's generating. I mean, those are, are wonderful. Moreover, it's really easy to create those shavings. I had to push really hard with those other scrapers to create those shavings. This guy, is fractional amount of work required. You also notice that because of that curved shape, you can see I'm getting these really thin shavings. I think, I feel like I sharpened this edge. This one, I'm still getting shavings, but I'm getting a little bit bigger shavings because I've got a larger edge. Here's the thing though, you still wanna be bending these you don't really want to be presenting the entire edge. The idea is not to use this like a plane and be getting the entire edge. If that's what you're really looking for, then you probably need to grab your smoothing plane. But there is most definitely a 
noticeable ease when you've got a sharp blade. And you'll notice there's very little dust. It's just all shaving coming off of this guy. And those shavings are lovely, light, and fluffy. So this one, this one's ready. You also notice the angle in which I'm presenting this is very near to vertical. There's vertical and it's grabbing maybe five, 10 degrees off that. And it's giving me shavings with very little effort. So that's what we're going for. That's what we're shooting for in a sharp scraper. So I'm gonna go over to the sharpening bench and, uh, oh, you know what, one more thing, because I know my card scraper is pretty dull at this point. So here's my card scraper. Um, I, by the way, I set these, I drop it down on a flat surface and I push the blade down until it makes contact and lock it in place. The projection, the depth of cut is produced by turning the thumb screw. All right, well, maybe it's not that dull because you can see, uh, did I just sharpen this? Maybe I did and I forgot. Now I'm getting shavings, but I'm also getting thicker shavings than I got from that uh, Bearcrat sc scraper. And now it could be because I'm taking a thicker shaving, but this is harder work. I do have to push harder to make this cut but it's still cutting pretty well. You can see the shavings I'm getting. Unfortunately, you can't feel the shavings I'm getting, but they are probably twice the thickness of the other ones. And that's really the beauty of a cabinet scraper like this is this can be a rough tool. This is a fantastic tool for leveling glue lines in a panel. Um, it will eat through glue really quickly. That, depending on the glue you use, it can be hard on your blade, but that's why we learned to sharpen, right? This can be really, really fast at leveling an uneven glue joint um, between panels because I can turn this screw more and actually increase the depth of cut. I can back it off and lighten the depth of cut. And get now a shaving that is about the same thickness as what I was dealing with with the regular card scraper. But the benefit, obviously, is we have a sole now. And the sole is going to help flatten out the surface. So here, I actually can get a little bit of skip in this plane because the sole is holding it off the work. And I did a pretty fair amount of scraping with this guy. And you can create a hollow pretty quickly. So I've actually got a hollow formed over on this left side of the board. And this cabinet scraper is having trouble engaging it. Now, the more passes I take, the more I'm flattening out the board. I've got a high spot over on this side. You see, it's, it's not grabbing that much over here because the high spot is actually lifting the, the plane out of the cut. So if I come over here and take some more passes on this side, I'll start to be able to take more off the other side. And that's the benefit of a cabinet scraper or a card scraper is now you're combining the high cutting angle that reduces tear out or eliminates tear out with the essentially the depth stop action of the sole of a plane. Scraper planes just give you more mass, give you a larger blade, give the ability to do much, much larger surfaces. So this cabinet scraper does not have a burr rolled on it. And the reason for that is because as you can see, it's not necessary. You know, you see the shavings that I'm getting off of it. So again, going back to what I said at the very beginning, if you're really struggling getting shavings with your scrapers, just don't roll a burr. Leave it alone and don't roll a burr for now. And make sure you can get that perfect 90 degree edge because that may be, you know, that's, that's obviously the foundation. If you don't get that right, it doesn't matter how well you roll the burr, it's not going to cut the same. So um, the problem, once I start rolling the burr, is I've got to make sure that the, the burr engages at this angle, the frog angle of this plane. And if it doesn't engage properly, you saw how these scrapers were different. 
This scraper, now I can't remember which one was which, but they're both dull. This scraper engaged at a higher angle. This one engaged at such a low angle, it was almost unusable. So if I roll the burr on this at such a low angle and it's just not engaging because I can't actually rotate the blade back or forward, it's fixed in place. With a scraping plane, you have the ability to rotate that back and forth, but then you spend a lot of time kind of futzing around with that angle to get it just right. You're better off, this is how I was taught, um, to just um, grind a bevel. And there is a bevel on this guy because it's substantially thicker. It's a good two times thicker than a regular card scraper. You grind the bevel so that you get that finer point, but you've also got a 45 degree bevel angle. So it's a very, very stout bevel. Grinding it lower than 45 would make this point very delicate and it really wouldn't stand up very long at that high scraping angle. So you grind it at 45 to make it, to make it more durable. So let's go over to the sharpening bench. Let me make sure I can answer some questions here if need be. Does grain direction really matter so much with the scraper? Not really, Ken. That was Ken, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, welcome to apprenticeship, by the way, Ken. Um, it doesn't really matter. You can scrape with the grain, against the grain. In fact, this board, I'm going with the grain here. Let's flip it around, grab a sharp scraper, because what do we know? Sharp fixes everything, right? And now I'm going against the grain. I'm not really getting shavings. I'm getting a lot more dust now. I'm getting little shavings because the fibers themselves are breaking back on themselves. So it's not really the same, but the surface is nice and smooth. So there's the key. You're not gonna get that same kind of shaving you might expect when you're working against the grain, especially in this board because the board is cut at a strong bias. The grain is rising sharply up to the surface. So I'm actually you know, taking those fibers and bending them back dramatically and they're breaking off. So I'm getting tiny little kind of stringy shavings, but they're not particularly long because the fibers just can't withstand that. If the grain was, was lower, more in line with the surface, I could probably get some more traditional shaving out of the whole thing. But again, I'm getting uh, you know, a nice smooth surface here working directly against the grain. And it's the same idea with putting uh, in a bevel up plane, grinding the, the, the bevel angle higher. So you're bending it up steeper. So when the blade hits the shavings, they curl very quickly and they break very quickly. Once the shaving breaks, it takes the force off the rest of the board. You know, when the shaving doesn't break, it actually wants to lift out the board. That's called tear out. If you've ever had a splinter, oh, well, hello. Rabbit just wandered up to the window and like peeked in. I guess he was interested in learning about scrapers. Bye. Um, if you've ever had a splinter, uh, especially on something like Douglas fir that's really snapped out, super long, like, you know, widow maker looking thing, that fiber, that, that splinter ran out and it tore out on the end. The chip breaker or the bevel angle on a bevel up plane forces that splinter to go up quickly at a sharp angle and it actually breaks that and that's what causes it to curl back on itself. So shavings are really just a series of broken grain curled back on itself. So advancing the chip breaker or changing the bevel angle on a bevel up plane, um, closing up the mouth so that you've got more pressure in front that's holding that, that chip down, preventing it from running out, prevents tear out. That's how we control tear out. This has no mouth. It has no bevel angle. Well, technically it does. It's 90 degree bevel angle. But because it's presented at a very high angle, you're forcing those chips to curl up immediately back on themselves and it does not tear out. Um, it's just, it's kind of the one-on-one of hand planing. So you can deal with all kinds of weird gnarly grain uh, in any, any number of different boards, figures, species, etc., with a scraper. So I'll admit, I think this angle is gonna work for us. I'm trying to get an angle that's enough off my shoulder so you guys can see what I'm doing while not blocking the shot. And without pulling out my 100 foot HDMI cable. <laughs> I've got a nice six foot HDMI cable, which is not long enough to reach over to the sharpening bench, and then a 100 foot HDMI cable, which is just a royal pain to have around. 
Um, there was another question I saw. How do you properly strike a scraper with a mallet when cutting half-blind miter dovetails? Uh, you mean one of these guys? These kerf maker guys? I wouldn't call that a scraper at all, although technically I guess it is the same type of stock, but this is not sharp. This is not sharp at all. In fact, you'll feel that this is slightly rounded over. Um, I don't know that there's a proper way to strike it. You put it in the kerf and you tap it in until it bottoms out in the bottom of the kerf. I mean, you put the, the, the scraper in the same way the saw went in and tap it down. Um, but you've got to take little bites or you worry about actually splitting the wood apart. What are your thoughts on the Lee Nielsen cabinet scraper? Um, is it any different than like a Stanley number 80 or the Veritas one I have? I don't think it's any different at all. So my thoughts are, I'm sure it's just fine. I haven't personally used one, so... I can't really speak, but you know, I've got lots of Lee Nielsen planes. Um, for the most part, they are um, replicas, I guess you would say, of Stanley. So um, I'm sure it's just fine. Let's switch camera angles real quick. What sandy grit would you follow up with after scraping? Uh, no, none. Why would I want to mess up the edge by then sanding it? That just sounds silly. Ah, oh, shoot. That's not going to work, is it, guys? Um, I guess if I really wanted to sand um, after scraping, I mean, if you're getting light, fluffy shavings like that, I really see no reason to sand. Um, you should already have a finish-ready surface at that point. Um, and all sanding is going to do is actually muddy the surface like substantially muddy the surface because it is um, the scraper, pardon me as I'm off camera here, I'm just rigging up a longer cable. Um, the scraper is creating slight undulations. So the little bit of scraping that I just did on this board, I don't know if the light will pick it up, but you can see, see that strip right there? Right there, right there, right there. Those are little scallops. Very, I mean, I can't even really feel them as I run my fingers across, but you can see that's where a shaving came up. Now, if I come back with like a hard sanding pad or a hard random orbital sander and sand this, it's going to not hit the entire surface. So you're gonna end up having to sand those out and do substantially more sanding in order to get a, a relatively, to get a flat surface. The, the sanding platen is going to want to create that flat surface. And you have just created an unflat surface using a card scraper. Um, the surface should be perfectly clean and finish ready. So there should be no need to come back with sandpaper. I suppose if I had to, you know, if I just had something that just would not agree with me, just could not get it cleaned up, <clears throat> then what I would do is start with 180 maybe, maybe 220. Um, I just don't think I would want to go below probably 180 or it would just end up messing up the surface too much. Does that make sense? The bigger issue is not, you know, is it a finished ready surface, but you're completely changing your method of, of surface prep. You're changing from a blade that's cutting the grain to an abrasive that is essentially shredding the grain. Um, sanding abrades the surface and creates all kinds of tiny little tears in the surface. And that's why, you know, we talk about raising the grain when you sand, you put that first coat of finish on and all those little torn fibers stand up on end because they, they've filled up with moisture and you have to come back and knock back that raised grain. The reason the grain doesn't raise when you hand plane a surface is you're creating one sheet, not tiny little tears in the surface because you've abraded it. You've cut it off in one sheet. And those, you, you know, when you put water on that, there's no little torn fingers to stand up. It's the entire surface is uniform. So I've changed from that blade cutting action 
to an abrasive action, and that's going to cause, um, it actually may like make the surface look worse, and it may look mottled under finish at that point. So I avoid sandpaper at all costs. Um, I just, I don't use the stuff very much because I can get a better quality finish off of a hand plane or a card scraper. All right, I think this will work a lot better. There's a reason to have a third camera for this kind of setup. Uh, won't the scallops be visible after finishing? No, not at all. Well, I mean, maybe. Um, if you, in the right raking light, I suppose, like now, you can't see the scallops on that board at all. If I turn it up and put it at raking light, they start to show up. Um, a lot of what we're seeing here as well is the color differential. This board, this cherry board, has had quite a bit of time to kind of oxidize. So you can see the color difference, like right there, that darker patch, that has oxidized. That patch next to it was freshly cut, so it's a lighter pink. That's a lot of what you're seeing. If you run your fingers over this, you will not feel that. And honestly, okay, I'm gonna get off topic here, but you asked. The human eye prefers the imperfection. Um, a perfectly flat surface, um, let me put it this way, several experiments, experiments were done and there were um, tables that had been perfectly flattened uh, using machines and then tables that had been flattened with hand planes or scrapers, leaving a somewhat imperfect surface. Now imperfect, I mean no tear out, but not perfectly flat. The light reflects off of that not perfectly flat surface better or, or, or in a more active way because you've got little divots and dips and the light has more things to bounce off of. And what happens is the human eye looks at it and when you compare one to the other, invariably people choose the handmade surface because it, it's got more life to it. There's more going on with the light. It's playing with the light that allows you to see the depth and luster of the wood a lot better because the light has more things to bounce off of. More importantly, and I think the ultimate compliment of a piece that you've made when you show it to you know, a non-woodworker or even a woodworker, the first thing they want to do is touch it and they want to feel the wood. Well, that may happen with a lot of things, but if you put a perfectly flat surface and a handmade surface side by side, nine and a half times out of 10, they're going to touch the hand wrought surface because the light plays off it differently. It looks better. It looks more attractive. So. The answer to your question is, I suppose, yes, those tiny undulations will be seen. The good news is that's a bonus. Um, I could clean this up with a scrub plane and leave visible scallops, and that's a very different thing. The tiny little scallops I'm seeing here only make the surface look better. And I don't really think that's a matter of my opinion. Um, there's many examples of handmade Windsor chairs and, and factory machine-made Windsor chairs, and the handmade ones, they just look nicer, they look better, and people are drawn to them, they feel better. The tiny imperfections that you feel under your hands makes it feel more like wood. So maybe we're getting into philosophy here at this point. The, long, the short answer to this is no, I think you're overthinking that because the, those scallops are so minor. If you can't feel them on the surface, it's nothing to worry about. So yeah, there's my, uh, my preach. Let's go sharpen something because technically I've only got 20 minutes left till I got to stop because I promised the better half that I would stop. So, we can see the sharpening bench. Um, file, burnisher. I'll get to the burnisher in just a second. Um, oh, I need my, card, my cabinet scraper. So let's start with the cabinet scraper first. Now, this has, uh, you know, a tiny tiny little bevel on it. It's got a 45 degree bevel, but because it's, it's a pretty thin material, it's still a tiny little bevel. I freehand sharpen everything I, I do. This one can be a little tough because it is so hard to feel that tiny little bevel. So I have a block for that. And just happens to be a block of teak. It doesn't have to be teak, but I can then roll it down this block Block gets a little sticky. If 
The good news is because it is such a tiny, whoops, sorry. Because it is such a tiny edge, it does not take a whole lot to clean up that surface. Change that setting so that, there we go, that's better. And that's enough. I can feel a tiny little burr on that back side. So I'm gonna come down to my finest grit stone and just wipe that off. That burr is gone. And so this is sharpened exactly the same way that I would sharpen a plane blade or a chisel. It's got a bevel. I'm sharpening until I feel a burr and then I'm swiping off the burr and I call it done. Using this block, it's just the same thing as using a honing guide, but I find that a lot of honing guides can't match this steeper 45 degree angle. And there's the burr that I'm looking for. So now I will wipe that off. Very good. This guy's done. That's all I got to do to it. Um, I'm not going to roll a burr on this, remember. So this is treated exactly the same way as a plane or a chisel. And I take it up to that high grit. I actually don't strop my um, scrapers because as I said, it's just too hard to feel that bevel angle. And while I don't have to perfectly match the bevel angle on a, on a cabinet scraper like this, I don't want to be dramatically off. So I'm gonna just leave it at that. Call this guy done. Set it over here out of the way and we'll try it out in just a bit. Um, next is the cabinet scraper and I forgot which one was which. I really should have made, well, it doesn't really matter. So the first thing I have to do, because there have been burrs rolled on this, is I want to make sure those burrs are gone. So I flip it on its side and I work back and forth just to remove any edge that is there. Because again, if that edge breaks off, it breaks off in a frayed way and it leaves a weaker edge. Shouldn't take long. And I hit both sides just to be sure. By the way, this is what happens if you leave one of those little vinyl magnets on like for years at a time, it stains. <laughs> it's not the end of the world, but you want to keep your card scrapers pristine and lovely. Don't do that. Okay, so no sharp edges or anything like that. Um, I don't think this needs it, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, I want to file an edge on this. So I've got a little block of wood, hardwood here and I clamp it in my vise and I've got it set ever so slightly proud of the block. So the block is my guide and the scraper is just a little bit higher than that. So now I'll come back with a mill file and essentially rest in the mill file on the block. I can now file this at 90 degrees. By the way, I made sure that this edge is 90 degrees to the face that it's clamped to, key point.
And again, this is kind of the major surgery. This is like going back to the grinding wheel and a chisel. I don't do this very often, but if you're really struggling with your scrapers, it's a good idea to come back and reestablish the edge. And here we go. I'm just going to make a little mark on this because there's not going to be time to sharpen all of the edges. So I'm just going to make a mark saying which edge I just did. Normally when I go back to the, the uh, grinding stage, if you will, like this, I would do all four edges. It's actually the sole reason that I have this vice on this, um, this bench. It's the whole reason it's there. Yeah. It's helpful when you get it really close to the edge because it doesn't take but a few passes to level it out. So now I've got a reground edge. And technically, I could scrape with this and I'd be, I'd be good to go, I'd be done. What you'll find though, is it's not gonna be particularly durable. The, the shavings you get on here won't last very long because the file is a very rough tool. So the file has created um, a not a very uniform surface. Again, it's kind of got that frayed edge to it. So it will cut at 90 degrees, but where you're gonna really find success is actually refining that edge. This is the same way if I were to sharpen a chisel on a belt sander with 80 grit, it would be sharp, but it wouldn't stay sharp very long because the edge is not refined. If I take that chisel and work it up through the grits and work up to 8,000 grit, I'm gonna have an edge that's going to cut better, cut cleaner and last longer because instead of a bunch of little frayed edges out here, it's gonna be a uniform edge that will dull, well, uniformly. So here's where I think a lot of people miss is they don't take the opportunity to actually now hone what they've just ground on the stone. So here's why I love diamond stones, because you do this on a water stone and it will cut a groove in that stone so fast. So using the same block with the 90 degree edge, I can hone that. And again, because the edge is so tiny, it doesn't take very long. I'm going to go down to my extra, extra fine stone. I mean, this is just idiot proof because the block is holding it at exactly the right angle. Now, there's no burr that I'm looking for here, but I am looking for a uniform scratch pattern. I can shine it and get the little reflection of the light. And what I want to do is kind of rotate my wrist back and forth and just kind of roll that reflection down the edge and back. And you'll be able to see if there's any oddities. The scratch pattern created by this coarser stone is going to be different than the scratch pattern on this finer stone. And it will actually pop out. It'll look like a dull spot in the edge. And this is, is uniform shininess the whole length. Um, yeah, let me go ahead and hone this one too. I thought maybe we'd show what it looked like if it was... Just hone both of them. Like I said, you don't have to hone it, but you'll be back sharpening again a lot faster if you don't hone it. And if you find that you're getting shavings, but the surface feels kind of rough, the surface doesn't have that smooth, plain, finish ready feel to it, it's because the quality of the edge, i.e. you didn't hone the edge, is lesser. Um, so you can still get shavings but end up with a surface that isn't particularly pretty. I had to unplug my camera here, so it keeps wanting to auto shut off on me. Because the camera's not actually recording. Shine the light on there. Okay, I've got a little dull spot right there where I haven't grounded all the way. 
Fortunately, there's just no way the camera's ever gonna pick that up. So I'm gonna use two hands now and just make sure that I'm pressing down on the scraper. I'm getting full contact. It's possible there's a slight low spot there, but I did hit that with the, the coarser stone. It's not that much coarser, so it shouldn't take too long to remove that. Yep, it's gone now. So now this edge is honed the way I want it. So I'm gonna leave this scraper without a burr. So no burr. And this one I'm gonna roll a burr on. But to do that, I really need a better camera angle. So I've changed the method that I use to roll a burr um, a couple times over the years. Um, I have a regular crown burnisher that I picked up at Woodcraft years ago. Um, you know what it does now? It's the guide peg on my leg vise. <laughs> so it lives down here in the leg vise. It's the fanciest guide peg ever. Um, years ago, I bought one of these guys, this Veritas, uh, Veritas, Veritas um, burnisher. Now here is an example where because you can repeatedly set an exact angle on this burnisher where you could possibly think about adding a burr to your cabinet scraper or your scraping plane because dialing in this angle will tell you what angle to set your scraping plane frog or the angle of your cabinet scraper. Um, you can set the burr, set the angle here and make sure that that burr is always grounded at the same angle. Again, I think that there's no doubt that the cabinet scraper without a burr is more durable than with a burr. It's going to last longer and cut longer without the burr. And I think it's a bit of a trade-off. I could maybe get uh, a slightly nicer cut by having a burr or even a more aggressive cut by having a burr. But because I've got the sole that's holding the plane back from cutting too deeply, that excess, the extra part of the burr, I don't think really plays in my favor. So this is a, one example where if you do determine, you know what, I would do better, I'd get a better cut if I had a burr on my scraping plane, get one of these guys because it will allow you to exactly set the angle. There's a little carbide rod in there that as I change this angle, it changes it inside the, the tool and then you just run this guy back and forth through that and it burnishes the edge. Um, what I'm going to do here is use this burnisher is a, this is carbide. That crown tool is, uh, I don't know what kind of steel it is. It's not carbide. And I don't think it's high speed steel. It's, it's a harder steel, but it's definitely not carbide. Carbide is really the metal steel of choice for rounding, um, to roll a burr. Everything else doesn't do it as crisply. The carbide is so hard that it grabs that edge and it, it deforms it exactly. Think of this between the difference between folding a piece of paper and creasing a piece of paper. If you just fold it with your fingertips, but then like use your fingernail and actually run a crease down, the sharp edge there is, is the difference between carbide and um, non-carbide. And it, I think it really makes a huge difference. Plus, different card scrapers materials, depending on who you buy it from, can be of different hardnesses. I've got one card scraper that actually has, it's a bimetal blade and there's a, um, a forged section on the end to create a harder scraping surface. Um, so carbide is the one metal out there that we know, the one steel out there we know that's gonna be harder than everything else on our shop with the exception of the diamond stones that I have over there. The other thing about this burnisher is, um, by the way, this came from Blackburn Toolworks. Um, I had one that I was using for years with a little handle I turned myself um, and uh, Isaac saw it one day and said, you need one of my burnishers and this is much prettier. Um, the key with this is it's very short. It's also got a conical point, and I'll get to that in just a second. The very, very short handle means that it's a lot easier to control the angle of the burr that I'm creating. A longer blade, let me go ahead and grab this guy again. The longer blade is very unwieldy, and it can be hard to, to control it. It's kind of like choking up on a baseball bat. If you choke up on the bat, you've got a lot more control and it's a lot easier to bunt because you're grabbing it up higher. I've got just this little bit of, of burnisher out here. 
So I can take this and I will purposely set it at 90 degrees and I'll just kind of drop my hand a degree or two and I'll roll it towards me and I'll roll it away or yeah, roll it towards me, roll it away. And I'm not, I'm starting on the scraper. I don't want to start off and try to get that corner. I'm starting on the scraper, pulling it towards me, starting on the scraper and going off. And that way I make sure that I hit both corners. There's a fair amount of pressure down here. And there we go. That's what I want. I can feel the scraper edge and my finger wants to catch on it. It's sticky sharp and doesn't want, I have to kind of exert more force to pull it off the edge. That's all that I want to do there. If I run it very, very lightly, I actually don't, if you've never done this before, if I run my finger along the edge, I can feel one consistent burr there. No little bumps or anything. Moreover, if your finger catches, I'm practically no pressure at all. If your finger catches here, that shows an interruption in the burr, a little frayed edge or a broken part of the burr that could cause weakness. I can feel that it's uniform along the entire edge, which means the entire edge is folded over so it's much, much stronger. So there is my burr. It's the way I want it. This guy, remember, does not have a burr. So when it comes to rolling a burr, I mean, it, it's almost a non-event. It's so quick. It doesn't take long at all. The biggest key is the short handle. The next key would be carbide. Um, carbide is not absolutely necessary, but the shorter handle helps. Now, what I'm going to do is test this and see how I like it. I don't think, you know what? I'm going to do one thing. Here is the, the uh, scraper that I use that doesn't have a burr. I did not hone this other edge, so it's not the perfect um, uh, test. But what I'm going to do is actually roll a much steeper burr here like way too steep. You can see the angle that I'm creating here is probably closer to 30 degrees. It's a really, really steep burr. I'll set that aside. Here is the scraper that I like. And big fluffy shavings and very little effort. Remember I talked about how easy it was to use this rounded scraper? Very little effort. And you'll notice I'm not having to lean over real far. The scraper is engaging just off 90. So I've got plenty of clearance for my fingers. And I'm getting lovely shavings. And the board absolutely feels like glass. So getting those lovely fluffy shavings and the important part is this is amazing like to answer the, the question earlier about what sandpaper would you use if you take sandpaper to the surface you should be shot <laughs> i mean you'll feel this and you'll think why would i ever want to put sandpaper on this because it's just so smooth really silky smooth lovely lovely stuff so that's that's this is how it should be done. That sounds really arrogant, but this is the way that I do it. This is the way that I want that scraper to be. And the crazy part is um, when I run across, it doesn't feel like a huge burr. I can definitely feel there's an edge there, um, but it doesn't feel real big. If you feel like a definite edge, so you can actually catch your fingernails in it, that burr is too big. Um, and more than likely what's happened is the burr was rolled and then it's folded and it's kind of crumpled up. So you're, you're not getting cutting at all. That, that larger edge you feel is a crumpled and distorted burr that's not going to cut. So now, if I go back to, let me get you the closer camera angle again. If I go to the, the scraper that does not have a burr on it, let's kind of examine how that's cutting. Because you remember I was very key to say you don't have to have the burr. So hopefully this doesn't bite me in the butt. So there's the edge that I want. And there's the camera angle I want. No burr. So this is going to engage pretty quickly. Oh, 
Oh, whoops, that's the wrong edge. Where's my arrow? Oh, there's the arrow. It rubbed off. There we go. <laughs> so that's a shaving coming off a scraper with no burr. It's easy. You know, I'm not having to press real hard. The angle of attack is high. It's actually a little bit higher than the other one. But you can see the light fluffy shavings I'm getting. Um, let's set those right there. If I were to lay those shavings beside one another, no burr and burr, there's really not a huge difference between the two. Um, this is a little bit lighter, a little bit fluffier. This is a little bit thicker. You can see how this has rolled up and it's actually a more, um, the shaving itself is holding together a little better because it is a little bit thicker. This just kind of falls apart because it's so light. So maybe this is half a foul and this is a thousandth of an inch thick. I mean, it's, it's a minor difference. But again, if you continually find yourself struggling with rolling a burr, skip it. It works. Um, you know, I honestly don't know what the durability is like. To me, it seems like the no burr would be more durable than the one with a burr because that burr is just hanging out there. It's more delicate and it's going to deform over time. And when it does deform, you get that more visible or that more tactile feeling burr that just doesn't cut at all. So maybe you just skip the burr altogether. Um, you never know. I, I, I do think that there can be some merits to it, but if you are struggling with it, skip it. So now I'm gonna slide this guy back in and again, I set the cabinet scraper down on a flat surface and just let it bottom out, tighten it up by hand and then come back and really cinch it down. You could use like a shim or something and have it cutting without, um, without turning the thumb screw and then you'll actually present a flat edge to the work, but you have to be careful that you don't end up gouging it if your corners dig in. It's the same reason we put a slight camper on our camber on our smoothing plane blades so the corners don't dig in. So a little turn of the thumb screw and it's starting to engage. Let me turn a little bit more. There we go. And again, I just did a whole bunch of scraping freehand, so I don't have a perfectly flat surface. This is wanting to create a perfectly flat surface at less than thousands of an inch um, tolerance here. So it took, you can see it's now starting to give me shavings. It took a couple of passes to do that in order to flatten out the little kind of localized scallops I was creating just by working with the, the card scraper. But now, again, no burr at all, and I'm creating light, fluffy shavings. Same effect as the card scraper, although one could certainly make an argument that this is a lot more user friendly. Dang it, I gotta really plug that camera in. The cabinet scraper, because it's got big handles, because it's got a sole on it, the whole thing ends up being so much easier to handle, to use, to create a, a tear-out free surface. You just recognize that because it does have a sole, um, you might have to take a couple of passes in order to level out any localized scraping that you did with a card scraper. So my regimen, if I have tear on a surface, I will hit it with a card scraper really localized, like within you know, one square inch to remove that. And then I'll come back with a smoothing plane or a cabinet scraper. And I will find that I'm skipping over that spot where I use the card scraper because I hollowed it out. 
some instances that's fine because the hollow is not noticeable. Other instances, it just means that I'm gonna make more passes with the plane in order to level everything back down to normal. But if, if you carry nothing away from this presentation is that the burr in some respects is overrated. Um, you saw the difference in results from one with a burr and one without a burr. Oh, um, sorry, there was one thing that I wanted to show. If you roll a burr too far, the burr is fine, the burr cuts fine, but you have to really turn your hands down too far to get it to engage and it becomes unusable. You can use a burnisher like this with a conical tip and I can get that tip to kind of slot into the burr. And actually I find it's easier if I pull it towards me. If I nestle the bevel of this cone against the body of the scraper, and I drop it in there and pull back, I'm actually deforming that burr and bending it back up. And because I'm rubbing the bevel, I'm bending that burr back up at a set angle. And I wanna say that's a 45 degree angle, I'm not exactly sure, but I'm making that burr uniform. So the conical point can be really beneficial for troubleshooting. Um, if you specifically turn the burr very shallow to begin with, you're good to go. But if you found that it's been turned down or it's deformed in use, this can be a way to actually correct the burr before going back to the stone, assuming you have a conical point on the end, which is again why this is a nice burnisher to have, but that's why it comes to a point like that. Um, uh, who is it? Uh, Phil Lowe actually talks about this quite a bit. He had an article in Popular Woodworking, or Fine Woodworking, years ago and he I think does that on every single time he sharpens just to unify um, maybe it's because I do a lot of freehand work I find that I can pretty much keep a consistent angle as I roll it across but if you have trouble with that and you, that angle is not consistent just roll the burr and then come back and unify the whole thing with the conical point um, that can be really really beneficial so uh, any questions here Uh, the larger diamond stone that I use, that's the DMT uh, Magna Base system. Um, it is a fine, extra fine diamond stone. It's double-sided. And then the one on the ground is an extra, extra fine stone. Whatever the grit is there, you know, a lot of people say extra, extra fine is 8,000 grit. Other people say, no, it's more like 6,000 grit. I don't know. I don't care. Um, so... Fine and extra fine is the larger 12 inch stone. Extra, extra fine is the smaller one. The whole base is magnetic. It's called the Magna Base System. Love it. It's all I use for sharpening. It's, everything gets done there. I love the larger stone. Um, lots of surface to work on. Very, very nice. I picked it up at Tools for Working Wood. It's available a couple different places. Um, Gary, burnish scraper. Left, right, on same edge, right? I'm sorry, Gary, I'm not sure what you're saying. Burnish left, right, on the same edge, right? Are you saying can you burnish, uh, uh, put a burr on both sides? Technically you can, if that's what you're asking. Technically you can roll a burr on one side, flip it around, and roll it on the other side because it's not two-dimensional, right? This is a three-dimensional object. There is a flat here. And what we're doing is rolling the corner on one side, rolling the corner on the other side. If I was gonna do a full sharpen of the scraper plane, if I wasn't pressed for time, I would sharpen all eight edges. So I've got four sides to this rectangle and four sides to that rectangle. So there are eight cutting edges here to, to do. And it's a really good idea to do all of them and then one of the great things, in addition to um, the magnet providing a heat sink, is it provides some directionality to the scraper. So you know, while the magnet's on this side, I'm cutting on this face. So as things start to dull, I flip it over and keep cutting on that face. If that starts to dull, I flip it around, change the magnet to the other side, and I can continue cutting on this scraper with four edges, and technically four more edges if I use the short sides. Do you find your hands hurt after scraping a larger piece? Um, I would not use a card scraper to scrape a dining table. Um, that is where 
if you're scraping, a scraping plane comes into bay. Yes, my hands would probably hurt if I tried to scrape an entire 60 inch long dining table, but that's called choosing the right tool for the job. To me, I would much rather use a smoothing plane for that. If I have such nasty figure that the smoothing plane won't work, that's the day that I will go out and buy a scraping plane. I don't have a scraping plane because I've never been faced with that situation yet. My personal taste, I don't actually use a lot of figured wood. I kind of like straight grain wood more than anything else. Yes, Gary, we were on the same page. Eight burrs per card. Uh, Darth Dweeb, nice name. Can I get good results to the crown burnisher? Um, you can, you can. The best thing you want to do if you use the crown burnisher is not grab it by the handle. Or I suppose, I don't, again, don't know what kind of steel this is, whether or not you could hacksaw it, but what I would do is choke up on it. Get to within like two inches of the end and then roll it. You're going to feel the difference. If I hold it way out here, this is really unsteady and it's really hard to, to, to grind, to, to roll a consistent burr. You feel really exposed. I suppose you could hold it by the handle, but then grip the, put the scraper like right in close. Personally, I find that this handle, first of all, the handle's too long, the handle's too big, it's just heavy. So even if I roll it in close, this steel is too weighty, it's too heavy as compared to the very light, delicate deal here. I mean, this handle is substantially longer and quite a bit thicker, and it's just the balance is off. So what I would do is grab it like real close, maybe even